Thank you, Andrew and Laura. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Unity Church of Ames. This is a special day. I feel like a kid who's been waiting for Christmas. <laughs> Daniel Neymar is with us today, and he is going to rock the house. If you have are visiting with us for the first time, you picked a good day to be here. Just listening to the um, practice and the warm-up. Ah, oh, okay. It's going to be great. So welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome if you're a first-time visitor. And our chaplain for today is Steve Newell. And he will be available to pray with you in our prayer room after the service from 11.30 to 11.50. And then we do have coffee and treats in the community room, so please join us for that as well. If you're visiting for the first time, we do have a guest book, and we'd invite you to sign that if you'd like, and take a welcome packet with you so that you can learn about who we are and what we do here. This isn't usually my gig, so I have to kind of get myself oriented here. Okay, I'm supposed to pray. Okay, I'm a minister. I guess I can do that. Let's just breathe. Yes, let us pray. Living, loving presence of God, we open our hearts, we open our minds, we open our voices, we open our whole being to the power of music. We allow the sweet notes to just pour through us, breaking down all resistance, breaking down all barriers, knowing that when we sing, we pray twice. So we are open and receptive to that whole spirit flowing into and through and as us. We are so blessed this morning to have a beautiful being of light lead us in song and in our celebration. So we sit for just a second, knowing how blessed we are in all ways, and allowing the power of the Holy Spirit of God to be present here this morning to celebrate with music. And so it is, and so we let it be. Amen. Amen. And I believe we begin now with Swing Wide the Doors. So, welcome Daniel Neymar. This looks a little bit like a, a college, like physics class or something, where most people are hanging in the back few rows. It's like that all the time. I'd be afraid of me. I'd be afraid of me too. Hello. <laughs> I'm Daniel Lamont. Nice to be here. Really nice to be here in Iowa on a beautiful sunny day. And uh, here we go. This is a song by me. If you don't like songs by me, you're in trouble today. <laughs> so fair warning. Sing it again. 
sounded great because we're going to do that song with the whole month of June. So don't forget what it was like today so we can keep the energy going. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, what am I supposed to do now? We sing it. Join together. This is a prayerful intention. And we hold that intention by saying it here on Sunday and then living it the rest of the week. So would you please join me in our Unity Worldwide Foundation Statement together. There is one presence and one power in the universe and in my life. God the good, omnipotent. And then we also have a Unity Church of Ames affirmation. Together, through the Christ Spirit in us, we create a better church and a better world. So be it. And we do the same thing with that. We say it, and all week then we live it. Amen. Now, please stand again because we have our call to celebration, sacred love. Oh. Uh -huh. 
feel like I've been to church. <laughs> I think we have the daily word, and it's Leilani. Things go wrong. 
wrong? It's natural to wonder. What celestial rule did I break? When things go right, it's logical to ponder. What credit can I take? But the truth is so much easier. I don't need a master plan. I can live here in the moment. Cause my life is in good hands. I don't need to know. Thank you. 
a child of two lawyers. My mom was an attorney at a bank for about 30 years, and my dad is still a law professor in Chicago, where I grew up. And I was most definitely not raised to write a song like that. In fact, I wasn't raised to do anything other than be a lawyer. In fact, my parents would still send me to law school and still can't understand why I never went. And um, so songs about um, not needing to know, that's, that's kind of a foreign language for half of my brain. And, and if you're sitting there thinking, no, no, you do need to know, I'm with you. The other half of my brain thinks that other half is completely full of it and, and uh, is, is living in fantasy land. But for me, um, I have, at least for the last 17 years, kind of been living true to that song. Not at all a master of surrender like that, not even remotely a master of it. I still worry, I still plan, I still sometimes pretend I'm in control. Um, but, but by and large, I'm not, I'm not fully a hypocrite on, on that. that. That is actually my very weird lifestyle, is to write a song, record a song, perform a song, sell an album, and now with a little boy and wife and dog, wake up in the morning, scratch the dog, hug the wife, hold the boy's hand, and that's the life. And, and um, it's pretty fun, and it's never kind of easy. <laughs> There's many harder lives in the world, but uh, many, many harder lives in the world, and many harder professions, but that is my profession. And I, I, would say, I would say the hardest part of my profession is simply that nothing is certain. That's it. So every day, there's no 401k, there's no salary, there's no paycheck, there's just me making a life, making music. And there are, like I said, many worse ways to be. Um, but, so 17 years I've been doing that. Before that, I was pretending to be a computer programmer in Chicago, and kind of had an epiphany in December of 1997, December 4th, 1997, I had a, a moment where I suddenly realized that I wasn't supposed to be engaged to the girl I was engaged with. I wasn't supposed to be working the job I was working in. I wasn't supposed to be on the career track that I was on. And I probably wasn't supposed to be living in Chicago. I was born to be a musician. I've always been a musician. It's the thing that makes me giggle the most and makes me most happy, spinally. You know, just everything about me has always been about music. And, um, and I said goodbye to the fiance, and I said goodbye to the job, and I said goodbye to Chicago, all of which you can imagine would be the most painful, easily the most painful thing I had done to that date, probably still the most painful day I've ever had, uh, and um, kind of died that day. And then 17 years of making music resulted. All of that born from, you know, more or less an explosion, <laughs> a catastrophe, you might say. A catastrophe struck my life, a disaster, a tsunami, an earthquake, you know, Richter scale, eight point, whatever, wiped out everything that I thought I was, and uh, ended up in Los Angeles just a few months later, uh, sleeping on my brother's couch, <laughs> and then rented an apartment in West Hollywood and started making records, and uh, my 16th one's coming out in a couple months, and I don't have a million dollars in the bank, and I've never worked with Madonna, but I do, um, I, but I have made a living writing my own songs and making my own records for 17 years. And for the last uh, five, supported a wife, and for the last three, supported a baby. And uh, I'm pretty proud of it. In fact, um, I, I, I say this pretty, pretty regularly um, on stage, I'll admit, because I, I, it matters to me, is if you know somebody who's planning on doing something insane, but simply because it's what they love to do, it, it, is their, it passes their giggle test, you know, as I like to say. Like, it's so fun that they can't believe somebody would pay them for it, and they want to do it, and it's crazy to do it. Don't tell them how unlikely it is that they'll succeed. For me, anyway, no one, I was not raised to make music uh, for a living, but I was certainly raised to be skilled, to be educated, to be a nice boy, to be a good boy, you know, to follow the rules, to pay my taxes. I was raised to, do, to, be, to be good at whatever I was gonna do, and no one said, when I, when I said I'm moving to LA to make a living making music, no one said that is just so unlikely you're gonna succeed, you know? Keep, hang on to a fallback plan, you know? No one said it, no one said it in my close circle anyway. And if I had known how unlikely it was to succeed, I probably never would have done it. Because I've gone to music industry events 
with 2,000 people in a ballroom. It was the weirdest moment. I'm sitting with literally 2,000 people, and the, the uh, officiator of this event says, um, while talking to the panel, he turns to the audience and says, how many of you make, uh, I think he said, $40,000 a year or more in music? And two people raised their hand, including me, in a ballroom of two, and I'm like, oh, I'm in the wrong room. What am I doing? This is unbelievable. I can't, you know. So anyway, so if you know something, don't tell them it's unlikely. I never, that's my advice anyway. I never would have done it if I'd known how unlikely it was. Nobody can believe my story in the music industry. They literally don't believe me um, because I've done this for a living. Um, uh, but there are stages of surrender that I've experienced uh, through my, by the way, this has nothing to do with the power of music. That's all right. Sorry. I mean, it is about the power of music in my life anyway, but I don't know if it'll, you know. All right, anyway. So, um, so I, uh, so but seven years after starting to make records in LA, and again, so making records means it's nothing more glamorous than I've got 10 songs, I hire somebody in the studio to record them. Now I have my own studio, but I hire somebody in, my own, in the studio to record them. I hire somebody to design the cover. I hire somebody to manufacture a thousand copies and let's see if anybody cares. That's kind of the business, right? So when I say I made records, I made a half a dozen records in the first six years. And then uh, in year seven, I started feeling the discontent again. The discontent that I used to feel when I was a computer programmer. And uh, given that this wasn't what I was supposed to talk about, or planning on talking about, most likely there's somebody in this room to whom I'm speaking directly. Um, and and uh, what I discovered is, uh, when I was a computer programmer, is that if you tell a lie often enough, if you pretend, convincingly enough to others, you'll end up convincing yourself, or you'll forget who you really are and start believing who you are claiming to be. Which, in my experience anyway, is not actually a path to happiness. It's more a path to heartburn, in my case, weight gain, in my case, almost certainly thinning hair, if you've seen my dad. Um, you know, it's, it's all coming, and the, 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 the louder you lie, and the longer you lie, in my case, the more accelerated aging is, and I was on antidepressants back when I was a computer programmer. I was fighting with most people I knew. I was easily cranky. Is this ringing a bell for anybody? So I was lying for a living. So seven years later, when I was making music for a living, I didn't expect to feel that discontent, but there it was again, and I had learned the hard way not to ignore it, because I was not about to blow up this beautiful life, but I needed to hear what I was supposed to hear, and Los Angeles is approximately the loudest most intense, most crowded place in the universe, as far as we know, <laughs> except maybe Manhattan, or I don't know, Singapore might be pretty crowded. Um, but LA, West Hollywood is pretty dense. And uh, so I left my place in West Hollywood and uh, moved to a little town in Utah called Moab. Anybody know Moab? It's Red Rock country. Uh, um, Arches and Canyonlands National Parks. A very, very spectacularly beautiful place. And I just vaguely remembered it from my move to L.A. from Chicago. The move to L.A. to Chicago, I'll do it in your direction. Chicago over on the 90, all the way across the United States. I stopped in 10 national parks on the way. Badlands, Yellowstone. If you know the area, you know what I'm talking about. And then down through Tetons, down through Utah, Grand Staircase Escalante, and I drove through Moab at the time, and I just remembered, that was a cute little town, I, I don't remember anything else, and I called up Moab Property Management, which I looked up, I think, on the phone, on the phone book at the time, and this is, only, this, is only, this is almost 10 years, this is 10 years ago now, and I said, can I rent a house in Moab? And she said, when are you coming? And I said, I don't know, how about January through March 2006? She said, if you want to come into Moab in January, you can drive into town, point at the house you want to rent, and it's it's available because everybody leaves. It's a, it's a tourist and a nature town, and it's abandoned in the winter. Five thousand people, four thousand of the five thousand residents leave. The houses, the, you know, the houses are empty. Main streets shut down. The national parks are empty, and I'm like, this sounds ideal. Okay, rent me a house. I don't. I, just get me a house with a bedroom in a, in a quiet somewhere. 
and they rented the house. So I showed up January 1st, 2006. I drove my Subaru uh, from LA to, to Moab and um, sat down on the couch in the living room uh, with big, big pane glass windows uh, out uh, looking out at 300 million year old red rocks, um, Los Alamos Mountains in the distance in Utah, snow covered. And I thought, what the hell am I doing here? I had no plans, nothing to do. As a song I wrote there, there's no one to know, nothing to prove, no promises to make. It was a blank slate. I told almost no one on earth where I was going, and, um, and I started writing songs on about the second day. And they started coming three, four, five a day, to the point where I wrote 125 songs during those three months. And some of them are awful. In fact, probably at least a solid half are awful and have never been heard. And a handful are very cranky, funny pop rock songs, which became a record. But a good chunk of them, a good chunk of them became a, an album called Water, um, in which I uh, ask questions like this song asks. But I'm going to tune my guitar real quick. At least one string has bothered me before. If the race 
is over, what then? Right? Maybe I don't have much time. And 
if the water that carved this place can't even guarantee that a place that the place this magnificent is going to last, maybe I shouldn't be quite so focused on whether anyone knows I was ever here or remembers me in some specific way. How heavily, I started asking myself, does how I'm remembered or thought of weigh? How heavily does it weigh on how I act? And maybe more importantly, what I do day to day. How heavily do expectations of who I was supposed to be weigh on what I do today? Pretty heavily. Who I'm supposed to be, how I'm supposed to act, Right? What religion I'm supposed to practice, what I'm supposed to believe. Has anything humans have ever done lasted like the red rocks and arches have lasted? Not even remotely. We're not even in the ballpark. We're dabbling with time. We're playing with it. We're dipping our toe, not even our toe, in time. The way the earth is playing with time and the way the universe is playing with time. But yet, every day, if you're like me at all, we worry what we're getting done, what we're not, what we're achieving and what we're not, what we're building and what will last, and what people are saying about us and how they'll remember us when we're gone, when none of it actually matters beyond what I decide feels good, feels true, feels right, feels loving, feels of service, feels kind, makes me happy, makes me laugh, makes me giggle, puts my little baby boy's hand in mine. He likes to weave his fingers in here like this, right? Thread his little tiny little fingers. Is there anything I can do to save that feeling? Right? I, I like to think that the, uh, the cell phone business is the loneliness business. And the photo photography business is the illusion of holding on to something business, right? It's pretending, which is why cell phone cameras are so popular. I've got 2,000 pictures of my son on my phone right now. You know, I'm trying to hold on to something that can't be held on to, and that is actually true about everything. Nothing can be held on to, really. A memory, as long as we're here, that's nice. The voice of my buddy, I love it, I can still hear it, but I'm the last, besides my parents, there are only a couple of us who can still remember what my buddy looked like, smelled like, what her clothes felt like, what a hug was like for my buddy, and she's only been gone since 1987, right? So I still have her handwriting, I still have her little uh, address book, so I happen to know what her handwriting looked like. But if you think about the details of your life that you worry about, the ache in the shoulder or the or the triumph in in you know math club in college or the the you know the little stumble at your wedding that made everybody giggle. I was in a wedding yesterday, my cousin's wedding is why I'm in Iowa. And you think about all the details that make up your story. They're all only yours. And if they're yesterday, they're done. And if they're tomorrow, you can't plan them. And in fact, would you really want to plan them? I started thinking while well, I'm in Moab. Would I really want to? I started thinking, what are the best things in my life? I'll ask you the question. Think of the best things in your life, whatever things means, any of them. Got them? What are the best things in your life? Now ask yourself, how did they get there? Anybody plan them? Were they on anybody's 10 year list, a 10 year plan? The best things? No, 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 no. The greatest moments of joy? No. Greatest moments of surrender? No. Greatest moments of insight? No. Greatest, deepest love? No. Deepest joy? No. Greatest relationships? No. Child, parent, friend, marriage, dog, cat, job, passion, art, your greatest creation, your best idea, your locks of hair, your, you know, your, your shapely knees, whatever it is you love about yourself or love about your life, generally, I, I have yet to find an exception actually in these 10 years, unplanned. So why do we spend every day mapping out how things are going to go when not only can we not know, but 
what we don't want to know. In fact, we think we want to know because it's the illusion of control. It's why we pay an economist. It's why we pay a doctor. It's why we pay a, a plastic surgeon. It's why we pay a, a pharmacist, right? It's why we pay a newspaper to tell us where we're going. It's why we pay a politician to tell us where things are going. And everybody's full of it. <laughs> All the experts are pretending to know. And it's very lucrative to pretend to know. In any field, it's very lucrative. So, so do I know what I'm talking about? Absolutely not. This is only what's true for me. Does anybody really know what God is or wants? Well, maybe everybody knows. But I'd say if anybody knows, everybody knows. Because there's certainly no monopoly on it that's ever been established. I mean, people like to give a monopoly certificate to a couple of people who have lived. But I think those people maybe more than anyone, than Jesus and the Buddha, those people maybe more than anyone would have said out loud and probably did, I have no monopoly on this information. I'm not an expert on God any more than you are. That's what God is. If God made every, anybody, God made everybody. If God had one idea, God had all the ideas. If God created you, God created me. If God created the the uh, the rainfall, God created the drought. If God created the, the snowfall, God created the rain. You follow what I'm saying? It's all the same stuff, and nobody can see where it's going. So, rewinding to the fact that I am the child of two lawyers, this is a, an entirely internally contradictory way for me to live. And it is my daily existence. Is that I trust, and I breathe, and I do what I'm called to do, while the other half of me says I'm insane <laughs> and squandering, right? Squandering. Anybody feel like they're, if you don't use something you're able to do, you're wasting it, right? Or if you, if you, if you pull up short in a relationship, you've, you've, uh, you haven't tried hard enough, right? Or if your business fails, you fail, right? When nobody says that to the arches in Arches National Park that rise and fall and millions of people come and they don't just take pictures of the, of the arches when they're at their peak. They're beautiful when they fall. And does anybody blame the arch for failing one day? That balanced rock is coming down. Is it a failure or was it the day it was time for it to come down? And what if that were okay? Right? What if you had already done enough. Does anybody, including myself, allow themselves the feeling of satisfaction on any given day to think, I've already done enough. The rest is gravy. I've already loved enough. I already told the people I love that I love them enough. I've already done enough acts of kindness. I've already made the world a more peaceful place enough. Anyone? I've already made enough money. I've already grown my business enough. Does anybody feel that? I mean, it's tough to be human. We are in a daily battle with ourselves to grow, to get bigger, to get louder, to get longer, to get more accolades, more credit, more praise, more, right? Every day. It's relentless. So, and I did go late. Did. I'm sorry. And I'm going to wrap up now with a song. Not sure what song I'm going to wrap up with, but I'm going to wrap up with a song because I promised I wouldn't go late and I went really late. Sorry. There is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, um, so. What I was going to say is we're not, given that I'm, I'm a hypocrite, that I haven't mastered any of it, what I have found is dabbling in it makes a difference. I would not expect you, nor I, nor anyone who has ever lived or will ever live to be so detached from outcome, so separated from the results of their efforts that they take no credit or blame. Right? Take, everybody wants to be remembered. So given that, we are all students of that kind of idea, if you choose to be, I am, uh, dabbling in it is enough to make a big difference. 
Experiment with loosening your hands off the steering wheel a tiny bit. Play with the idea that it's none of your business how it turns out. I find anyway, in the last 10 years, I sleep better, I think clearer, I make happier decisions, I make truer decisions, I write better songs, I even make more money, M you know, better business decisions because they're not rooted in who I was supposed to be or who I think, how I think it'll turn out or who I'm supposed to turn out or how I'll be remembered. If I, the, the, the mantra I use is yesterday is done, tomorrow's none of my business, and today I have all that I need. Yesterday is done, tomorrow is none of my business, and today I have all that I need. So let me sing one more song. I'm going to come to the piano for one song. Thank you for having me. Sorry for going late. Here we go. Thank you. And I hope you come this afternoon with a lot of music, much less talking. I can almost promise. I have a lot of songs I meant to sing, so sorry about the stories. I hope, I hope it worked for somebody in here. I, I don't know. I never know. Here we go. So this is a song from the album After Water called Time for Fire. Very autobiographical, so you'll recognize me in it, and hopefully you won't worry about me too much. There's the kind of life when every choice it makes the safe one predictable. When every moment's like the last one, everything even slightly, barely scary is locked away. It's the kind of life where your engine's never running, sitting tight, and know your heart is hardly running. Nobody better be messing with the schedule for your usual day. So big it's never done But if a life can be now 